we will look to escape because our eschatology or our understanding of the end times doesn't have um, any sort of place for conflict. So when there's conflict, we will be getting restless, thinking that this is the end and looking to kind of bunker, bunker down and then to escape to escape the earth. The problem with that is that the character and nature of God is that he is no stranger of conflict. And in fact, when you read um, the prophets, uh, they were always entering into the conflict. When you, when you see even the creation of the heavens and the earth, it was in a place of conflict that the Holy Spirit hovered, okay? So if we don't have... Uh, if we don't have conflict as part of our understanding that it's within the conflict, that's where there's opportunity um, not to keep peace, but to make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. There's, there's, a, there's a kind of peace that we cannot produce outside of battle or, or war. So when there's war and when there's conflict, we see that as an opportunity to hover and to guard escape. Okay, likewise, if we don't have a theology or understanding of who God is and how he operates for redemption, that when there are pie, because we've already dropped a gavel on who they are in that time and that place, because they cannot be redeemed. They are locked in this place. And when we, uh, when we find ourselves attacking, it's because it is revealing that there's a component that's missing in our theology, and it's a building block. It's a fundamental building block to the gospel, and it's the value of redemption. And that means that, that who you are right now, that, that this probably isn't the same person that you were in the past. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That when we, drop, when we drop the gavel on someone, when we make a judgment on someone, we are saying that, that God is incapable of changing them, or perhaps Jesus died for the whole earth except for them. Therefore, enabling and empowering us to attack them. And the question is, of are we attacking people that Jesus loves and died for? So there's stuff that gets exposed in our hearts through our behaviors because our behaviors expose our true beliefs. Yep, and, 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 and in this place, when we find ourselves in this place without a theology for redemption and without a theology for, for restoration, um, uh, uh, then we find ourselves somewhat powerless in the present. But when we can receive the gospel narrative as relevant, meaning the fact that Jesus died for the whole world in her sinfulness and depravity, that that is radically relevant for the chaos that we find ourselves in right now because his blood is powerful and speaks and it can absolutely change the narrative of a nation and a generation. All the believers in Jesus say amen. amen. Yep, and so our conversations need to be filled and full of blood talk because the blood of Jesus will never lose its power. And so what I thought is that in order for us to do what I think the Holy Spirit wants to do, we have to kind of um, submit ourselves to his lordship. And I would like for us to do this together. Um, Ian Clayton actually has an activation. And in the activation, you go uh, into, into the spirit with a bucket full of paint, but it's not really paint. It's the blood of Jesus. And you begin to paint out and wash, and, and it begins to reframe. And I thought we could do that today as intercessors. And so would you join with me, and I'll lead us in a prayer. And I think this will prepare our hearts for what the Lord wants to say and do, because I just don't think that our, that our limited um, uh, uh, our, the, the limitations of our soul are not fixed in a place to be able to receive what the Lord wants to deposit to us today. So let's stand together. So we come, Father, before you, not as beggars, but as sons. And we trade out our performance economy for an economy of sonship. We come not trying to earn our way in, but we come as sons and daughters of inheritance. <laughs> and so, Father, we receive a fresh grace and a fresh, fresh understanding, Lord, and a fresh rest. And, Lord, we just take out our paintbrushes and we dip them in the costly, valuable blood of Jesus. And we paint our hearts right now. And, Lord, we thank you, Father, that your blood doesn't cover up, Lord. Your, your blood, it restores and it washes and it cleanses and it makes new. And, Lord, I pray, Father, that, Lord, that you would remove the calluses off of our hearts, Father, and give us a heart 
of flesh, Lord, that we could fill deeply, Lord, what your heart fills. And Lord, we take this paintbrush and we paint our minds right now. We ask, Father, for your grace, Lord. We, we take off, Lord, our helmet of logic and we put on the helmet of salvation. Lord, we thank you, Father, that we have the mind of Christ. And Lord, we ask, Father, for the renewing of our minds, Lord, that it would come into alignment with the truth of your word. And we take our paintbrush and we paint our feet and we declare the shotting of the preparation of the gospel of peace upon our feet, Lord, that we will not slip in the mud, but we will, having done all, stand firm in our peace shoes and our shalom shoes. And we take this paintbrush upon our property and boundary lines and we declare that no witchcraft can prosper on this property. We take this paintbrush over our city limits and we declare, we declare that we that we have been given this land, that we are landowners, that we have been given authority in this city of Newcastle, and we stand in our in our priestly nature. We stand in this place, Lord, and we give you thanks for our city, God. And we ask, Father, for your uh, for your protection and for your insight and for your revelation for our city and the people uh, that lie therein. And within this great region, Lord, we declare, Lord, your plans and your purposes that none would perish, but that all would see and have life everlasting in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated. So we all agree that we are to not escape, that we are not to attack, but that we are to garden. And the question is, is that like as we've been trying to flourish this last week, to what degree have we been able to successfully steward our gifts, our talents, our abilities in the earth in order to bring about change? And I don't know about you, but perhaps you felt some pressure uh, this last week in order to uh, to cultivate kingdom realities on the earth, knowing what what you should be thinking and doing, but 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 feeling the, that great resistance, knowing that it's hard to stand firm in the midst of a perfect storm. Wave at me so I know I'm not alone. Okay, all right. You say, what, what's a perfect storm? A perfect storm is a series and sequence of storms that hit the same place at the same time. And that's what we see in this time is all kinds of storms and all kinds of, of battle lines that are being drawn and all kinds of voices saying, uh, come and join um, our side, that, that my side is the right side. Pick your side. You know, who's, who's, whose side are you? Whose side are you? Whose side are you, you on? And, and um, it's, 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 it's really interesting. And the good news is everyone just declare good news. Because when you come to church, you should get some good news. Amen? The good news is that the, the Lord has, has armed you for such a time as this. Just to clear, locked and loaded. You have received weaponry for a time like this because we really are in a battle. And so 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, uh, verses 3 to 6 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power. Everyone declare divine power. Divine meaning directly from heaven. Power means the ability to get the job done. Power to do what? To destroy strongholds, okay? For we destroy arguments and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is come. Complete. So what we have right now is a very real battle, okay? What we have right now is a very real war. And what it is is we are in an era of info wars. That's what's actually taking place. We're in a battle of info wars, that there's a war of information. And we know that uh, the enemy, uh, the, and everyone's being told different enemies, and everyone's trying to figure out who the enemy is so we can attack the right, the right enemy. But we know, according to John 8, that the real enemy is not the Clinton family. The real enemy is the devil. The devil described here by Jesus who um, uh, uh, is a murderer from the beginning, uh, not holding to the truth. Why? Because there's no truth in him. That when he lies, he speaks his native language. So the native language of Satan is lies. Yep, for he is a liar 
And he is the father of lies, which is why if, if the devil ever comes and talks to you or if a demon ever comes and gives you some sort of insider's information, you shouldn't listen. Why? Because the enemy is incapable of telling the truth. Why? What does the enemy come to do? He comes to bring information. Information that will exalt itself above the character and nature and authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. That what we see right now is a great war of conflicting information, and this is not a new war. This has been the war from the very beginning. Why? Because the very first sin against God was the act of eating of the tree of information. And what did it do? It robbed the sons and daughters of God of their revelation of their identity and destiny in Jesus Christ. And if we eat from the wrong tree, that tree will cost us our... You see, when you eat of the tree of knowledge, of information, you will trade out your identity and destiny. You will trade out your revelation for information, and now you'll be a slave to that knowledge. The question is, is what tree are you eating from? What table are you eating from? Because you are invited to eat from his banqueting table. And when you look up, you'll see that the banner over you is love. That we see that the great uh, battle, the great information was the enemy came to Adam and Eve and said to eat of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because God doesn't want you to eat from this tree because if you had this information, you would be like God. Only problem was they were already like God. So when they were deceived and they ate of that tree, they thought they were going to get new information, but it lost, but they gave up uh, their revelation. And in doing so, they advocated their leadership on the earth and they were incapable of executing the mandate given to them in the garden to be fruitful and to multiply and to expand Eden, the place of convergence, the place where God walks with man on the earth. And this is what the enemy is trying to do. I, I had a dream. I'm going to get into it next week. And um, I saw, uh, 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 I mean, uh, I mean, uh, anyways, there's a real attack coming against the body of Christ. And the attack coming against the body of Christ is an attack against the, the neck. Why? Because the enemy wants to separate the head from the body so that there would be a church that's not in communion with the head, meaning that the body is independent from the lordship of Christ Jesus. Therefore, we've got the right bumper sticker, but we are not stepping, we have stepped out of, we have advocated our seats of authority on the earth. We are not gardening. Why? Because we're seated at the wrong table. We're seated at the table of information instead of the table of revelation. All right, good news. Everyone say good news. What's the good news? Verse 5, check it out. In verse 5, it says, we destroy. Everyone say destroy. destroy. What do we destroy? We destroy arguments. That's a, that's a good word. We destroy arguments. We obliterate lofty opinions, and we punish disobedience. Praise the Lord. Everyone say destroy arguments. Destroy. Obliterate lofty opinions. And punish disobedience. I'm going to give you a Greek word. It's um, logimos, logimos, and that is the word for arguments and lofty opinions. And what, what, what is that? It is the understanding. It, it's fake news that comes from your imagination that comes to establish itself as a reality. Again, what is this? Logimos. It's fake news that was framed out from the imagination that tricks humanity into thinking that it's real. Yep, and we are to destroy that. And where do we destroy it? Not externally, but internally. That this battle, that these weapons, that it's not against the culture, that we take these, these, these weapons, we take it in. We destroy arguments, lofty opinions, things going on within our imagination. And what are they trying to do? They are trying to build a narrative that would rise up to challenge the authority and the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because if we doubt, if we doubt the authority and the majesty and the lordship of the lamb that was slain, if we doubt what he's capable of do, now we will see that prayer is powerless. And now we will be Christians that don't pray. And now we will, we will, again, the title, the, the battle isn't for us to give up our title as Christian. 
the battle is to get to us to come into a place where, um, where Jesus is not our functional Lord and Savior. To get us to come in to try to accomplish something in our own might, in our own power, without collaborating with the Holy Spirit. So this is what Paul says. Take these weapons and go in. That we would cut off every conspiracy, every fear-based theology, and anything, anything and everything that looks bigger than God. There is nothing. There is nothing. And I'm telling you right now, God is not sitting up in the heavens freaking out. He's not sitting up in the heavens saying, oh, going back and forth between CNN and Fox News. Oh, 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 what am I going to do? What am I going to do? No, you want to know what he's doing? He's seated in the heavens, and he's laughing at his enemies. Why? Because there's no principality or power, any sort of cosmic thing that can intimidate Yahweh. You cannot intimidate Yahweh, but the enemy is trying real hard to intimidate um, the people of God. The battle is to remove Christ from our Christianity, to remove the anointing from the church. I'll tell you about the, the dream that I had. Um, I was with my family, and we were at this restaurant, and um, we, were, we were eating, and I looked around the restaurant, and I noticed that everybody in the restaurant was color-coordinated. It's like different clothes, but all their clothes were, were carefully color-coordinated. And I realized that... Um, this wasn't just a restaurant. This was a production. That, 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 that there, was a, there was a greater kind of plan to, to coordinate this whole entire restaurant because it was, it was being produced. It was going out. And so me and my family were, were there and we're, we're eating, meaning we're taking whatever's been prepared and we're taking it into us. We're, re, we're receiving it. And then I looked at, like, the waiters and the wait staff and the maitre d', and, I, and, I, and they were conspiring, and they were chatting, and they were, they were up to something. It, was, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't good. And all of a sudden, I realized, i got to get my family out of here. And the crazy part is that, like, like, in order to get into this restaurant, you had to go down these big stairs. You had to actually go down <laughs> in, into the restaurant. And the stairs weren't even attached to the wall. It was actually really dangerous. Like, this stairwell was really dangerous. And, and, and so I go up and I begin to confront the people that are in charge of this restaurant. They begin to get agitated. Now they want to get me and my family out of the restaurant. And as we're being escorted out, we come up to this, this elevator. And, um, and, and the gal that's escorting us out, she begins to quote the theologian and reformer, John Calvin. And I, and I stop her. I say, you don't even know who John Calvin is. And she, she goes, yeah, yeah, I do. And she begins just talking, saying a lot of stuff, but no actual, nothing credible, not, nothing to it. She just, she just starts talking. That's very significant because when we come back next week, I'm going to show you how John Calvin ties. This morning was just a wild, a wild morning with, with, with the Lord. I said, you don't even know who this, you don't even know what, what you're talking about. But you know what to say in order to trick people into thinking that we're on the same team. And, and this is, this is, what, I, this is what, I, what I feel the Lord saying in this, in this time is that the enemy is trying to get us to pick a side and to pick a team. And, and a lot of us think that if we pick the right party, we'll be, according, we'll, we'll be operating according to the right party. My concern is even though we're pr predominantly a two-party system, that there's one principality operating behind two parties. And therefore, if we pick a camp, if we pick a party as our primary operating system, we are going to be choosing to eat from the wrong tree, and the information will cost us our revelation, and we will not be able to partner with what the Lord wants to do on the earth. Why? Because our soul has too many hooks through it. And we'll, we'll be played like puppets, and we won't be able to be obedient to the Lord. Why? Because what he is saying is flying in the face of the information system that wants to control us. I'm not trying to bash our governmental system. I believe that the Lord has given us a government, and, and, and many Christians are called into, into politics. But I actually believe that, those, that the Lord's actually calling a remnant out of the political system and into a new kingdom system. And, it, and it's because uh, he needs to... We need to get detoxed we, because a lot of us, we've got a lot of, um, we've got a lot of unhealthy stuff in our spiritual guts and we're not, and it's not passing through us 
and what's happening is our spirit is becoming foggy so that our spiritual eyes can't see, our spiritual ears can't hear, and the only thing that we can sense or, or, or really feel is that jarring, um, uh, uh, it, it's, almost ha- it's, it's almost like the only thing that gets our attention is anything that's catastrophic and disruptive and triggering. And it's almost like this is how the enemy is controlling believers right now is by, is by pulling our flesh hooks and triggering our soul. And we're reacting, 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 reacting and not, and not gardening because y- you are incapable. We are incapable of partnering with the Holy Spirit when we've bowed our knee to a pagan principality that has offered us truth in the name of Christian righteousness. And what we are seeing is is a counterfeit form of Christianity where you don't have to think, you don't have to see, you don't have to hear, you don't even have to have a relationship with Jesus. Why? It's an attack against the neck to separate the head from the body. And I say, we're not doing it at Seattle Bible Center. We are not doing it. We are not doing it. We are not doing it. We have to see, we have to hear. Yeah, the brothers and sisters, our identity is not Republican or Democrat, Jew or Gentile, black or white. The goal is not for you to cut off your heritage and legacy and, and, and the beautiful tribal elements of your past. That's not the goal. The goal is for those components to not control you. That it's, it's about headship. It's about lordship. It's about relationship. It's about intimacy and the battle to come to the Lord's table. When you look up, if there's any other banner that's not love that's flying over, you're at the wrong table. He's inviting you to the Lord's table where the banner over us is love. The culture would say we don't need the message of love because the message of love is weakness and we've had weakness and we've had love. No, 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 no. You see, the love of God brings about true justice, which is not punishment. True justice is shalom, which is the restoration of all things that have been ugly back to beauty. The word justice is bringing beauty out of ashes. Without love, there is no good thing. Without love, there is no good thing that God does not take off his love hat in order to put on his justice hat, that operating from the throne of love, he brings forth and executes his righteous judgments. Would you stand with me? Would you consider allowing Holy Spirit to come to pull out every flesh hook, to pull out every string, that you are not a puppet of a political system. You are a righteous son and daughter with a spirit that's been intertwined with the Holy Spirit, that now is the time to arise and to shine and let the, to let the glory of the Lord begin to radiate from His Spirit through your spirit. So Father, right now, Lord, we hold out our hands and we ask that you would wash our hands and wash our feet. And Lord, we ask, Father, that you would come and cleanse all of our senses right now. And Father, we ask, Lord, that you'd remove, Father, the veil of perversion that's tried to separate us from you. Lord, you already tore the veil once, Lord, and and, and you will never veil yourself from us again. And yet so many things are trying to bring separation. And we declare we are not a separated generation. We are a generation of unification with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Whatsoever things are good and pure and noble and virtuous, we will think on these things. And when we look up, we will see the banner of the Father perfect love flying over us. We thank you, Father, that it's not blessed are the peacekeepers. It's blessed are the peacemakers. And we declare we are peacemakers. And we will do it for the right reason. We will not be motivated by pride. We will not be motivated by by some sort of earthly seat. We will be motivated by our seat, knowing that we are seated in heavenly places and from this place where we have already been elected. We have already been appointed. We have already already been commissioned. We don't have to perform for anything. We don't have to do anything good on the earth in order to get in. We are already in, and now we will execute the righteous justice of God. We declare, Lord, that your your kingdom will come. Lord, your will will be done through a remnant an uncompromised remnant that doesn't lift up its eyes to any idols or seek that which is false. We seek you, the God of Jacob. We ascend the holy mountain. And we thank you, Father, for the peace of God, the righteous justice of God, 
in keen discernment. Lord, remove every flesh hook right now. Lord, remove every hook out of our soul right now. Remove every, every hook, all, all fear, all, 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 all anger and unrighteous anger and, and even stuff that, we, that we've never been angry about and now we're angry about it and we don't even know why. The absurdity, the, the, um, the insanity of the, of the enemy's uh, soul constructs. Break them off, Lord. Lord, unshackle us, Lord, from every soulish construct of the enemy. We declare we have the mind of Christ, Lord, and the only helmet we will wear is the helmet of salvation. And the only breastplate we will wear is the breastplate of righteousness. And we take these, not these carnal weapons, Lord. We take these spiritual weapons. We obliterate every soulish, imaginative, fear-based conspiracy that would elevate and challenge the lordship and revelation of Christ Jesus. And we trade out our information for revelation at the foot of the cross. We thank you, Lord. You're reminding us who we are, who we are in you. We are the head and not the tail. We thank you, Father. We are sons and daughters of God. In Jesus' name. Everyone said? Love you guys.